and uh, as uh, dr lata said that we've uh, planned a lecture series uh, for uh, all our co professionals so we have planned it in such a manner that on all the saturdays from 5 to 6 we'll be uh, conducting a webinar and uh, that's going to go through three months you know in the month of august we have planned it for uh, research methodology for the month of uh, september it is going to be on the clinical practices and uh, the next one that's the october we have dedicated that to the paramedical staff and uh, i'm sure everyone is eager to listen to dr uh, senthil so we'll be starting with our first lecture today and uh, this lecture is uh, you know for the series of uh, research methodology and for this we have a speaker that's dr uh, senthil rajappa he is a very proficient and reputed uh, medical oncologist from india and he practices at uh, one second so he practices at uh, basa watarakam indo american cancer hospital and research institute hyderabad and he'll be speaking on use of evidence based medicine in clinical practice so he'll be straight laying more stress on study designs phases of clinical trials and evidence pyramid dr senthil please thank you so much uh, madam for that uh, very kind introduction thank you so much for that uh, very kind introduction and uh, good evening all of you uh, i am supposed to be talking on evidence based medicine today uh let me tell you that though i am an oncologist i will very rarely allude to examples from oncology uh, to stress upon some of the points that i will be making through the course of my lecture today uh the second important point is i will talk very very little about statistics and some of the things that you would associate with evidence based medicine uh what i'll do in the next 40 minutes is that we will uh, start with this case and then we will end up talking about how you should use evidence based medicine there's nothing that is perfect so you should also learn what the problems are about evidence based medicine and then i'll end by talking about something that's my very favorite topic which is the fourth dimension to medicine which is the patient doctor relationship so this is how we will go about structuring my talk today now let's start with this very common case scenario this is the only case that i'll be talking about from oncology after that it's it, in a, it's not oncology so here is a 65 year old lady who presents with abdominal distension and altered bowel habits for 3 months 10 kg weight loss performance status is 2 she has a malnourished look abdomen is distended the ct scan shows bilateral adnexal masses and peritoneal nodules her hemoglobin is 8.8 she's got an albumin of 3.2 so on the rounds your boss asks you what is that we should be doing to this lady now there's a big list of options that i put up here on the slides and all these options are right the surgeon the boss who's usually the surgeon says that looks like she can be optimally debulked so 
So let's take her up for surgery. She's malnourished. Her performance status is two. The other person who's probably a little junior, Antona goes up and she or he will say whether she will tolerate surgery. I meant the patient will tolerate surgery. Should we do some chemotherapy and then do interval debulking? And then somebody comes in and says, okay, let's do chemotherapy, interval debulking and do heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. There's some evidence that it improves overall survival. And then there's a fourth person who comes and says, it's COVID times, no major surgery now. So let's do chemotherapy first. One final person says, why don't we talk to the patient and the caregivers and then finally decide? None of these options listed here are absolutely right or absolutely wrong. I just want you to think about this problem. Think of everything that you would consider in this particular clinical situation to make a decision. We will come to this case at the end of this talk. Evidence-based medicine on this definition is the integration of best research evidence. Okay, that's one component of the definition. With clinical experience, that's the second component of the definition. And the third component is patient values. So it's the integration of these three things, which is best research evidence, clinical experience, and patient values. And this was a term that was coined by Dr. David Sackett many, many years ago. Now, having defined what evidence-based medicine is, it's also important to know what it is not. It's certainly not rattling out numbers from clinical trials because that's what we think, at least the way most of us understand evidence-based medicine is evidence-based medicine. So that's typically what it is not, rattling out numbers from clinical trial showing that you're a very erudite scholar. That's not evidence-based medicine. So the gentleman on the left is Dr. David Sackett. The gentleman on the right is Dr. Gordon Guyatt. Dr. David Sackett, as they say, was born in America, but he was a Canadian by heart because that's where he ultimately moved to in the McMaster University, where he got this group of people together and started propagating the concept that we refer to as evidence-based medicine. Now, though this concept started many, many years ago, it was finally coined and termed and published by the gentleman on the right, which is Gordon Guyatt. Now, he's an internist. David Sackett was a nephrologist by training. He stopped doing nephrology and went on to do clinical epidemiology, and he set up the clinical epidemiology unit at the McMaster University. And interestingly, he died in 2015 with cholangiocarcinoma. So he is no more. It's now five years since David Sackett died. But I think the concepts that he's put in, the concepts that have evolved from his earliest thoughts is something that we will always remain with. Now, this is the publication in the JAMA. This was done in 1992, though the clinical epidemiology in McMaster was started many, many years before that. Finally, it was published in 1992, and that's the paper you're seeing on the right. Now, before we go into the specifics, this is another important person that all of us should acknowledge, and this is Professor Archibald Cochrane. Now, what did Cochrane do? He was actually surprised during his time that there was no way that we could have a critical appraisal or a summary of the lot of literature that was available in medicine. So he put together this group that we refer to now as the Cochrane Collaboration. And this was named in his honor as the Cochrane Group or the Cochrane Collaboration. So this is what this very important gentleman also did. Now, just going a little deeper into the definition of what evidence-based medicine is, it's explicit, it's supposed to be judicious, and the conscientious use of current best evidence from medical care research to make decisions about the medical care of individuals. You know, the reason I put up Sashi Tharoor in that corner there is when I read through this definition, it looked like he was there at the time that this definition was actually framed. No, he was certainly not part of this definition. So for people who don't know English like me, 
it's important to define what these very difficult to understand words actually mean. Explicit means stated very clearly with no room for doubt. Judicious means it's done with good judgment and sense. Conscientious means doing one's work well and thoroughly. So it's again an amalgamation of many of these words that goes into the definition of evidence-based medicine. And again, I want to make the point there that it is not just clinical research and the evidence based on that. Now, these are the five A's or the steps that you use to move into an evidence-based model of care. Now, it all starts with asking a clinical question, right? And then in order to answer that clinical question, the next step should be to acquire the best evidence that is available for that day and age. Once you acquire the best evidence, it's important to appraise the evidence. We will spend some time today learning how to appraise clinical evidence. Step number four is to apply the evidence. Step number five is to assess your performance because it's very, very important to see whether what you generate as evidence is applicable everywhere and specifically to your center. And is it working the way you actually want it to do? So ask, acquire, appraise, apply, and assess. So these are the five A's that constitute the steps to evidence-based medicine. Now let's start with the question, right? So the question is asked in the abbreviation PICO. PICO stands for Patients, Intervention, Comparison, and Outcome. Now let's take the COVID era now. Let's take an example from a COVID clinical trial that we are running now. So the patient is typically a patient who's got a coronavirus infection. The intervention is some drug, let's say Ramdesivir, that you're using to treat this particular condition. The comparison is a placebo. Both the interventions and controls get what is standard care. In addition, the intervention group gets Ramdesivir, while the comparison group gets a placebo. The outcome that we are measuring should be death due to COVID. Are we bringing down the incidence of people dying due to COVID infection? So only when you ask the question, how do I treat patients with this particular condition, you can think of an intervention, you can think of a comparison, and look at an outcome that is clinically very, very relevant. Now, please remember this word clinical relevance. We'll come to that a little later when we discuss outcomes in clinical studies. Once you know what your clinical problem is, the next step should be finding the data. And I think that's not an easy thing to do because if you're looking at textbooks to find your data, this is what it is. Half of what you are taught as medical students or at any point in time will in 10 years have been shown to be wrong. And the problem or the trouble is none of your teachers know which is that half, right? So. Yeah, so whenever you're talking about medical literature, it's important to be current. And some of these, which I have listed at the bottom of the slide, is where you look for current medical literature. So the two most common areas that I look to is the PubMed and the UpToDate. It's a very, very good resource for the latest medical literature itself. You can also look to the Cochrane Library for systematic meta-analysis and reviews. Now, if you get all the evidence, it's important to understand that we should be using this evidence very efficiently, right? The problem is that we've got so much of information, but we are actually starved for knowledge. There's a lot of difference between having information and synthesizing that into knowledge, because this is the amount of literature that you're getting 75 trials per day, 2,000 indexed into the Medline every day, 5,000 into biomedical every day. So look at the magnitude, the size, and the quantity of medical evidence that is going in. But what is happening to all of us 
busy clinicians, we've got less than one hour per week to look at this evidence, while what's happening is 19 articles per day, 365 days a year. That's the rate at which evidence is accumulating. And I want you to go down and look at the BMJ date. It's 1995. I specifically didn't want to look at what's happening now because I would get depressed looking at that. So you get less than one hour a week. You're getting 365 into 19 articles per day, which you should be reading. And we are going in the wrong direction as far as time available and production of this evidence is concerned. And at the end of the day, physicians are of all sorts. There are people like me who don't want to read, but want to get the best grades and understand everything. There are people who think, I always keep reading, but I still fail. I'm not able to synthesize this knowledge. And there are a group of people like what's illustrated in the right side who are extremely busy and don't have any time for anything else but patient care work. So all this is not appropriate and ideal. So the question is, where do you actually acquire evidence from? And obviously, these are from two important or three important sets. These are studies and reviews. Now, when it comes to studies, you have two broad classes of these studies. One is called the observational study. The other is the interventional studies, right? So when it comes to observational studies, the two important types that we are looking at is called the case control and cohort studies. And the small illustrations on the right side tell you what a case control and a cohort study is. Now the illustration at the top talks about case control study. Now the major difference between a case control and a cohort study is in a case control study, the outcome that you're trying to look for has already happened. You've got cases. These are patients in whom the outcome has actually happened. And there are controls in whom this outcome is not there. So you've got a group where the outcome is, that's called the cases. You've got a group where there's no outcome that has occurred, that's the controls. And you look back, right? So you're looking back to see what is the kind of exposure to risk factors that either of these have had? Are patients who have had the outcome having a greater chance of having been exposed to a particular risk factor, right? Is this risk factor having a greater chance of being associated with this outcome or not? So that's what you're trying to look at. And generally, the outcome measures that you're studying or expressing it is in terms of a parameter that's called as odds ratio. That's something that you will learn in the next lecture next week. When it comes to cohort studies, it's a little different. You're starting from exposure, following them up and looking for the outcome. Remember, it's just the opposite of a case control. In a case control, you already had the outcome. For example, let's say that the outcome is having cervical cancer. You've got a group of women who got cervical cancer. You've got a women who don't have cervical cancer. You look back and see if there is a risk factor that is associated with the outcome, which is cervical cancer here. Let's say socioeconomic status. Let's say personal hygiene. Are women likely to have, are women with cervical cancer likely to have poorer personal hygiene compared to those women who do not have cervical cancer. That's what you're trying to look at in a case control study, looking back. What are you trying to do in a cohort study? Let's define what a cohort is first. A cohort is a group of individuals who have one similar character. Let's say smokers, okay? In a group of people, if you want to choose a cohort, a cohort may be a group of smokers because smoking is something that all of them share as a factor, right? So you take a group of people who have a particular risk factor. You have a group of people who don't have this. You follow both of these and then you find out whether the incidence of the outcome, in this case, it could be lung cancer, is higher in those patients who are exposed or have this risk factor compared to if you didn't have this particular risk factor. 
So that's what a cohort study is. A cohort study is prospective. A case control study is retrospective. In both of these, you are not intervening with any factor at all. You are just observing them and looking at the outcome. The outcome measure that or the, the measure that you use to explain or, or quantify in a cohort study is something that you call as a relative risk. So these are observational studies. What are interventional studies? Interventional studies are where you intervene with a procedure, you intervene with a drug, and so on and so forth. And these are divided into four phases of trials. Okay, it's phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. There are further subdivisions in each of these. Let's not go into that. Now, classically, if you take a drug that is being put to test, in a phase one study, you could either use a healthy volunteer or somebody with disease. And typically in patients with, uh, uh, you know, in cancer drugs, you typically use patients who already have cancer. You don't try them on healthy individuals. But let's say you're trying an antihypertensive drug. You could start by trying them in individuals who are healthy and then taking it to the next phase in people who have the disease in question. Right? So phase one is where you are looking at what the human being or the individual is doing to the drug, right? What is it that the human body is doing to the drug, which means we are looking at what we refer to as pharmacokinetics. How are we metabolizing the drug? So what are we doing to the drug? In phase two, you're looking at how the drug is acting or what is the drug doing to the individual, right? In phase one, you looked at what the individual is doing to the drug. In a phase two, you're looking at what the drug is doing to the individual. In a phase three, you have two groups of patients, one who takes the drug or the intervention, the other who doesn't, right? And then look for an outcome measure like we spoke about remdesivir in COVID-19 patients. Phase four is study which is conducted after the drug or the intervention is approved and is used for patients in the clinic, right? There are new things that you find out, especially regarding safety that you keep looking at after drugs are approved or interventions are approved and they are in the, in the clinic as such, right? Uh, for some reason, my screen is not all right. I'm not too sure why my screen disappeared. Hang on, I'm sharing it again. Yes, there we are, it's back again. Thanks. You also have systematic review and meta-analysis here. We'll come to that a little later. Now, having learned what are the types of interventions or studies, then you stack them up on this pyramid and start by saying, which is the best in terms of evidence, which is the least in terms of evidence? Now, something that we didn't discuss earlier is expert opinion. You know, something that we refer to as eminence-based medicine, not evidence-based medicine, right? Expert opinion comes at the bottom of this pyramid. You then have case series and case reports. You then have case control, cohort study, randomized control trials, and something that we refer to as meta-analysis. When is a meta-analysis done? A meta-analysis is done when you have plenty of studies randomized controlled trials, which are actually not giving you a categorical answer to the question that you are actually asking. So we put all of these randomized trials together and synthesize that evidence to come up with a meta-analysis and a conclusion saying, yes, this intervention works versus it doesn't. So that's what a meta-analysis. So it's a synthesis of all the randomized controlled trials and that's what stands at the top of that evidence pyramid. So that's how you synthesize evidence. Expert opinion is least. Meta-analysis is the highest in that level. So let's start by asking the question, what is a randomized controlled trial? Why is it called RCT? So you're randomizing people to an intervention versus a control. So you randomly allocate patients or 
individuals who have that clinical condition that you're trying to question. It's controlled because you have a control arm and you have a test arm. It's a trial because you're trying out a new treatment and comparing it with what you refer to as the standard of care. Many times what you do is referred to as blinding. The reason why we do blinding is to avoid bias in assessment of these studies. The investigator and the patient are blinded to the interventions, right? So the investigator and the patient are blinded to the interventions so that there is no bias as far as assessment is concerned. Now, when you put together all of these randomized controlled trials and ask the question, how effective are medical interventions? You will be surprised to know that a majority of them don't have very high level of clinical evidence or clinical significance. 85% of them have very, very small effects. You don't want to have very small effects on your patients. You want to have big effects because you want to make a big difference in the lives of your patients. Now, on top of that, if you're just reading the headline like you read the newspaper, reporting of these clinical trials itself can be misleading. Right now, these are phase three studies that were reported in two years in major oncology conferences. And look at what happens. A third of trials which were actually negative were reported as not negative. Now, isn't that wrong? Doesn't that give you a wrong impression of what the outcome of this study was? But that actually happens. And you actually get misled when you're just looking at the title of these results, which are usually very sensational because you want to attract people to your study. So if that's the case, you should actually learn to appraise the studies, right? How do you appraise? What are the questions that you ask? Is the result by chance? You should be able to scrutinize the methodology that we used. What are the validity of these results? And very, very importantly, how can we apply this evidence to our clinical practice? Because you don't want to end up like the picture that I've showed here where you've got a strong abstract, you've got a less strong introduction and terrible results. That's not what you want to end up with. You want to actually show that your hypothesis was strong. You proved the tested hypothesis and then you used it in your clinic also. So let's quickly run through how do you do this assessment. Title and the abstract, as we said, it's always sensational. It's like the trailer of a movie, right? When you see a trailer in the YouTube, it looks like as if it's super and you want to go and see the meeting. It's like the Zoom meeting video versus Zoom meeting with audio only. Most of us in the video look very smart. We look very great. But when you go and look into these studies, they actually may not be as good as what they look in the abstract. The abstract is just a prissy or an abridged version of what your article or the study is. So remember, don't run away reading the abstract only and coming to conclusions. Please go and scrutinize the study because that's when you will know what is good and not. There's always a primary objective that you should start with. Right? And you should always look at a trial where they have asked one simple question and will come to a simple answer, a yes or a no answer. Remember that studies which try to answer too many complicated ones or too many complicated questions are almost always not powered and are flawed and they generally are not useful for day-to-day -day use. Now I've shown this picture on the right. Let's read that through. BKS Iyengar practiced yoga all his life and died at the age of 96. Kushwan Singh drank whiskey all through his life and died at the age of 99. So what is it that gave you these three extra years? You're asking a simple question. And let's look at the reliable answer. The moral of the story is that whiskey gives you three year edge over yoga. Right? So you asked a very simple question. You've got a very simple answer. Let's not get into the statistics that this should have been randomized. 
internal controls, external controls. You should have asked Kushwan Singh to do yoga and so on and so forth. Let's not get into that intricacy. The point I'm trying to make is a simple question, a simple answer makes it maximally reliable. Now, we said you should have interventions, which means you should have controls. So the controls can be placebo, which means you're not giving them anything. You're just giving something very similar to the pill that you're using for the intervention. You could use what the existing standard for the day is, or you could use a conventional intervention. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is placebo should not be underestimated. Don't think that placebo is always a placebo. When you read trials, you will see that even placebos have adverse events when you get those reports up on, right? So as I put it here, you know, patients come in and say, the moment I see you, doctor, all my pain vanishes, right? And that's typically a placebo. So one should not underestimate the power of a placebo. There are people who think that using a placebo can actually be unethical, but that's for a different day. That's not for the discussion today. Again, what are the endpoints that you're looking at? Remember, always you should have a hard, clinically relevant endpoint in your study. Better not to use a surrogate. What is a surrogate? Typically for obstetricians, a surrogate is a surrogate mother, right? Instead of the true mother, you've got a substitute mother. So instead of the true endpoint that you're looking at or you want to look at, you want to have a short-term, easy-to-achieve substitute which may typically not be a surrogate all the time you also have primary endpoints and secondary endpoints please remember that your primary endpoint should always be one and very important for which your trial is actually powered your secondary endpoints can be as secondary as they sound that's not what you're trying to look for in the study itself these secondary endpoints can just be hypothesis generating. Now, when it comes to methods, usually it's full of statistics. And that's why I usually call them biostatistics rather than biostatistics. Because depending on how you look at it, you can call them a lie. As they said, there are three kinds of lies. There's lies, there's damned lies, and then there is statistics, right? So if you don't understand statistics, you can easily get carried away by what the publication actually is. Now, when you finally come to the results of the study, you always will have to look for something that you refer to as an intent to treat analysis. That means everybody who was randomized should be analyzed. You can't take people away because they are dropping out even before the intervention was given because that leads to a lot of bias as is illustrated in this slide and picture. So remember that whenever you're reading a paper, look for this intent to treat analysis and not something that we refer to as a sensor or a per protocol analysis, which can always skew and bias a study leading to wrong conclusions. So once randomized, always analyzed, and that's what you have to look at. And that's the reason why in any randomized trial, you have to look at this flowchart that we refer to as a consort statement, because it tells you how many were assessed for eligibility, how many were excluded, how many were randomized, how many received the intervention, because this also tells you how applicable it is to clinical practice. It also tells you how robust the conduct of the clinical trial is. And this is something that is now mandatory when you report a randomized controlled trial. The other important thing that I want you to look at in the research section always is that how do they actually express these results? Now, there are two very different ways of expressing results. One is called as the relative risk. The other is called as the absolute risk, right? Now, relative risks always are a little inflated in terms of the numbers, while absolute risks tell you the truth, right? Here, we are looking at an endpoint which occurred in 3% of the intervention arm and 4% of the control arm. So the difference in terms is 1%. 
Now, if you look at the relative list, it's 25%. Isn't that a big number? While actually the difference was a paltry 1%. Now, for the same relative risk, if the endpoint occurred in 100 out of 100 patients in the control arm, and occurred in 75 patients in the intervention arm, that's much more clinically relevant and significant, right? So that is why it's also important to look at the absolute risk reduction compared to the risk reduction, because that tells you how do you apply this on your patients. Now, the other thing that everybody does is something that we refer to as a post hoc analysis. That means you did a huge randomized study, Many times you may end up with a negative result, but the study is your baby. Come on, how can you accept that your baby was not appropriately correct? So whenever that happens, what do you do? You go back and look at whether this subset benefited, that subset benefited, and you will always come out saying that some subset benefited from that particular intervention. And this is what we refer to as a fishing expedition, a dredging exercise, or more importantly, as people say, if you torture the data enough, it will confess and say, okay, I give up. I have some benefit out of this intervention. Now, that is always an underpowered statistical analysis, and you should never take that. Now, that's so much about how do you appraise and what's the importance of evidence-based medicine. Now, I think before we end in the next five to seven minutes, we also will have to understand why not evidence-based medicine? So why is it that you should not always say that evidence-based medicine is the only way and the best way to apply to your patients? One, it's time-consuming. Evidence takes a lot of years to actually generate. Clinical trials are too controlled. You have a specific group of exclusion criteria, inclusion criteria. Your patient has to be fit to get into the study. But remember, the last patient that you had in your clinical practice is not going to come the way you like it in your clinical trial. He or she will say, I can't come tomorrow morning. I can't come for your follow-up next week. I have this festival at home. So patients who are in clinical trials are too controlled. Now, just to give you an example, in a large trial that looked at the intervention of a CABG in patients with ischemic heart disease, when they looked at what's its applicability to clinical practice, only 4% of patients in the clinic could actually have been fitted into that interventional study. So many times it is too controlled and not applicable to day-to-day -day practice. You always need some knowledge of statistics and many people, most people, and that includes me, have very, very basic or lack of statistics knowledge and hence you find it difficult to interpret. Most studies have some bias. There are conflicts of interest. And ultimately, do we really know whether it works in the clinic or not? Because you're looking at something on paper and what somebody else did. Is it reproducible in your clinic? I think that's very, very important to understand. And finally, the attitude of the patient, the physician, the access to that particular intervention and affordability of that intervention. Somebody could have done a lovely trial where the intervention costed 10 lakhs a month and you have to take that intervention for the next 10 months. How many of our patients will really be able to afford something like that? So that's evidence, but that's not something that you can apply. The other important point is that what involves generation of evidence is statistical significance or this value of P less than 0.05. Now that is statistical significance. This is the number that rules the scientific world because it's that eureka moment for all investigators. You've touched less than 0.05. There you are. You've reached the top of the world. But remember that everything that's statistically significant need not be clinically significant. And hence, we are all slaves to these numbers, but we should not be so. Look at the clinical significance. Now, I've added one more to the top of this pyramid that we saw earlier. That's clinical guidelines. Why did we actually add that? Now, let's come to the bottom of this pyramid for a moment. Expert opinion. Now, don't all of you respect the opinions of your bosses, right? Your gray-haired bosses, gray-haired lady or the gray-haired man, 
who is your boss, who's leading your unit, he has an opinion or she has an opinion about everything. After 20, 25 years of being in this field, I think he or she is entitled to an opinion. And especially when we say medicine is not just science, it's also an art. A lot of judgment and wisdom goes into making a decision. Won't you agree that expert opinion is very, very important? Your boss's opinion is very important. Coming up to meta-analysis, unless you have a good set of clinical data that goes into a meta-analysis, how will you come to a good conclusion? It's like saying, if you put garbage in, you will get garbage out, right? So meta-analysis need not always be super. Expert opinions need not always be bad. And that's the reason we are putting everything together now, which, con which consists of expert opinion, case control, cohort, randomized control, and meta-analysis to say clinical guidelines. And then you put these levels of evidence to the clinical guidelines starting from a level of evidence, which starts from one down to expert opinion again as level five, right? So clinical guidelines are very important. There's also something called as a grade of recommendation. If people or experts sitting in that guideline committee agreed completely or not, A is complete agreement and C is absolute disagreement. You can have something wherein the agreement is very high, but the level of evidence may not be very high. So all this can happen in clinical practice. Now, the other problem is the paradox of choice. Look at this. Dwayne Johnson is carrying a heavy bag full of guidelines. Now, the more the guideline, how will you really find out which is important and applicable to your patient? And I think that's where some more expert opinion comes in. So less is more. Sometimes too much of guidelines is also stressful because it doesn't help your decision making. And finally, evidence-based medicine is very disease-centered. You looked at the disease, you designed an intervention there, you looked at an endpoint that you thought was relevant to the patient, and you came out with a result. Now remember that this need not always be what our patient wants. How many of you have asked, what is it that your patient wants? Because that is what should be the outcome endpoint that you're trying to measure in a clinical trial and not necessarily something that you thought or the group of investigators thought was the most robust endpoint to study. So evidence-based medicine is very disease-centered and not patient-centered. Now, the other important things is the paradox of randomized controlled trials. You want a very homogeneous set of patients to get into your randomized controlled trial but you're applying this to a very heterogeneous group of patients, right? Your, clinical, your clinic is not a homogeneous set of patients. It's a very heterogeneous set of patients. So you're trying to apply evidence that you generated in a homogeneous group to a very, very heterogeneous group. You're also trying to extrapolate the evidence that you generated for a group to an individual patient who's sitting across the table Whenever a patient asks me, doctor, will this drug work for me? I don't have an answer to that question, right? Because I will say the drug will work in 50% of all patients. But are you in that 50% or not? I really don't know. So the question is, will it work for the patient? The answer is we don't know. So I think that's why EBM is an amalgamation of the many facets of which clinical research evidence is just one. You have to use your clinical expertise to trade the risks, benefits, inconvenience, and costs. Look at what the patient wants, the patient's values, and put in the hierarchy of evidence that is available to finally come to a conclusion, not just based on what the research evidence says. And that's why medicine is as much an art as it is a science. And that's the reason why I am showing you this diagram at the end. I don't think you would have ever risen to a, a, a talk on evidence-based medicine where this Venn diagram was shown at the end. Because I want you to clearly understand that evidence-based medicine is not just about research. 
It's about clinical evidence, research evidence, and very importantly, patient preferences, which should go into making decisions, not just what you get in a clinical research. And just to end on a slightly lighter note, these are many alternatives to evidence-based medicine. Eminence, experts, there's vehemence, you know, in a meeting room, whoever is loud is the one that's correct, isn't it? So that's vehemence-based, eloquence-based, somebody who's smartly dressed and can, you know, deliver the goods beautifully by talking so very well is eloquence. And then there is providence, everything is left to God's hands. And then there is nervousness, diffidence, Confidence-based medicine. Confidence-based medicine is very important because it applies only to surgeons and not to anybody else because they are the only ones who can say that. And I think the fourth dimension to medicine is something that we always forget, which is the doctor-patient relationship. You might be an erudite scholar. You might have written a thousand papers. But when it comes to your patient, this is what is important, right? Whether you watch the Tamil movie or whether you watch the Telugu or Munna by MBBS, whatever it might be, I think it's important to put your hand on that patient, give that patient a nice hug, which is what this movie is all about, being human, right? So that is something that we should never forget in the midst of all our science and evidence, because as some people criticize, Decisions regarding patient care are not made on the bedside, they are made in conference rooms. That's very paradoxical, isn't it? That's where evidence-based medicine can actually take us to. And if it's something that can actually summarize all that I've said in the last 45 minutes is, you treat a disease, you win or you lose. You treat a person, I guarantee you, you will always win, no matter what the outcome is. And that's typically what evidence-based medicine can be summarized as. Thank you all so much for your kind hearing and the time that you have given. Please ask questions if there are any. Thank you so much. Dr. Sabyata, I've handed over it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Senthil. And uh, there are some questions in the chat box. We'll just pick up from there. So one question is that are case control studies always retrospective? Uh, okay, so I think you've got some uh, lectures that are coming up uh, in the in the next uh, series, which will tell you or answer all these questions. It is most of the time retrospective. Now there are some studies that are called as. Uh, nested case control studies, which is very similar to a cohort study. So the simple answer is not always, but most of the time. And uh, there's yet another question from Dr. Asma. She's asking you that, is it ethical in cohort study in which we know the risk factor for certain disease and we are just watching them to develop the disease? I think we do a cohort study when we actually don't know if the risk association is very strong. So you do a cohort study only when you're not sure about it, not if you're sure about it. So there's yet another question from Dr. Tanya. She's asking you, sir, how are the different phases of trial conducted in radiation oncology? Oh, very interesting. So the beauty of radiation oncology is that you don't go through all of these phases <laughs> that medical oncology goes through. So what you do actually is that you are using that machine, you're using some modeling in order to look at what is the radiation dose that will be delivered to a particular area. Now, this whole thing can be uh, modeled based on a software. So if you look at the dose that can be delivered to a particular area, if it can be crisply delivered to that area only without affecting the other areas, and if it's a validated model that you're using to do this, then it can be straight away taken to the clinic and used there. So it doesn't go through the phases of phase one, two, three, and four, as I described. You could have phase four and phase three, but phase one and phase two are generally not there as part of. Oh, that's this one.
I'm just looking for some more questions. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. There's, there's yet another question, which is, uh, can we use the terminology bidirectional cohort that is retrospective study? Okay, so I, 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 started by, study. I started by confessing that my knowledge of statistics is very elementary and uh, I'm not an erudite <laughs> scholar at that. So if there is somebody who is a statistician in the group, I would happily pass that question to that person. I think you've got some lectures on this coming up next week. So, you know, stay there next week for you to get some answers. The simple answers I really don't know. So we'll ensure that your question is answered in the next uh, session, maybe. Great. Yeah. And uh, anybody else with any other question? And of course, rest, uh, you know, the whole chat box is uh, full of compliments for you. And as I said that uh, when I introduced you, that was just an abstract and your whole lecture was your, your actual introduction. So it's I didn't, the chat I, I boxes. Hope the, I hope the result didn't end up like what I showed. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Okay. So thank so what's the significance? Uh, Dr. Lata, there's yet another question. I think two more I can see. One is that, uh, what is the significance of pilot study? That is one question from Dr. Siddharth. Okay, so a pilot study is generally done when you want to uh, see whether something is feasible in your center or not, or feasible in multiple center or not. So you start with a small set of patients and you put in that intervention, look at the follow-up, whether patients are able to go through the evaluation methods, whether they're able to come to the follow-up as you want them to do. And if you're satisfied that it is feasible, then you get on to mount a larger study. So this initial small study that you do is called a pilot study. There's yet another question and that comes from Dr. Shruti. And uh, she's asking you, do cohort studies always need to have two groups? That's typically what a cohort study is. Uh, as much as I know what a cohort study is, that you, you look at people who have a risk factor, you don't have a risk factor, and then you follow them up to see whether they're developing the outcome that you think is of interest. So I, I, I think from whatever I know, it is two groups that you have to follow within the cohort. I think, Sabeta, yeah. there was one more question about what is a phase one, phase two. So I think Santhil will be the best person. Please briefly outline what is a phase one, phase okay. two. There was briefly. a question. Also. Okay, briefly, let me outline. So I am a medical oncologist. So I'm going to talk about phase one, two, three, and four from a drug development perspective. So as I said, phase one is where you look at what the human being is doing to the drug, which means pharmacokinetics. How are you metabolizing the drug? Is it going through the liver? Is it going through the kidney? When does it get to the C-max? When is it getting to the trough? And so on and so forth. In oncology studies, you also find out what's called as the MTD, which is referred to as the maximum tolerated dose. Because what you take through the next step is one dose level that's lesser than the MTD. You also look for what's called as the DLT, which is the dose limiting toxicity. So you look for what the toxicities are. You look for what the maximum tolerated dose is. You look for pharmacokinetics. So that's phase one. Phase two in oncology studies is typically done in a group of patients where you're looking for response rates, right? So let's say you're looking at a drug that you're trying in ovarian cancer and you want to see how many patients actually respond. Is it 50%, 40%? That is phase two. If you're convinced in the phase two study that you have a good drug in hand, then you also randomize that, which is a phase three study, to what is the existing standard for that day. Let's say existing standard is drug B, and you've got drug A, then you take a set of patients and randomize them to A versus B, or you could do A plus B versus B also. You add your drug to what is already existing. So that's phase three. Phase four is after this drug has reached the clinic, you're trying to collect data from the clinic, and look predominantly at safety issues because some of these safety issues don't show up in the typical studies that we do and can be a flag that is raised after the drug actually reaches the clinic. So that is as simple as I can sound. In fact, one Dr. Seema Singhal has already said phase one is a dose finding study. You're absolutely right. That's why I said you look at the maximum tolerated dose. One dose lower than that is what gets into the next level for testing. So that's what phase one, two, three, and four are. I can see yet another question. That is, does early ending of study as interim analysis shows positive results hamper the power? 
Okay, so uh, early ending of studies is always a problem. So there are a set of people who are called the data safety monitoring board who are sitting and looking at uh, what's happening in the study. If they find that it is unethical to continue the study anymore, it could be because of two reasons. One is that one arm is so efficacious that you don't think it should go on any beyond because you're denying the other group that intervention which they deserve. Or it could be from a safety standpoint wherein this new drug that you're trying is actually playing havoc with patients and it cannot continue anymore. So if you have a safety issue or if you have an efficacy issue, that will lead to early termination of the study. Of course, it's never good to terminate a study earlier because your endpoint can actually be skewed there. And hence, it's always good to continue. But I think at the end of the day, the ethical issues are paramount, not necessarily the scientific research question that you're actually asking. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sentil. Uh, you are and you are always amazing, you know, when it comes to the lecture. Yeah. So I think uh, I'll... So guys, uh, all the participants, I thank you all. What I've seen are is that uh, you all have clinical... Exp I'll come back to uh, Lata. Uh, Dr. Okay, Dr. Bhagya was, wants to say something? Yeah, yeah. One question, one question to yeah, Dr. Sure, Sir. sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Look uh, how can... much... Uh, interest he has generated yeah yeah that's for sure so can you tell again please what is the difference between intention to treat and per protocol okay <laughs> again, I, know, I know it's a repetition but then no that's it's... fine no that's fine because i rushed through that because of want of time i've got a clock on my right side which i'm looking at as i'm speaking i don't want to bug all of you guys okay uh, so let's go back there so intent to treat is always the best so the the example that i was showing is that let's say you start with 50 patients in two groups. One is surgery for cervical cancer stage, let's say stage 1A, and the other is radiation therapy for cervical cancer, which is also stage 1A. Now, let's say even before you did surgery, five patients died because of some reason, right? And then you go, uh, you know, they could have died either because their general condition was not good, they could have died in a road accident, whatever that might be. So you've got 45 patients in group A. You've got 50 patients in group B. Now, if five patients actually died either because of the disease or some other reasons, you already start with a weak group A. But you have a very robust group B. So now you're comparing a weak group A to a robust group B. What will you end up with? There's a high likelihood that you will end up saying that radiation therapy is a better treatment for stage 1A of cancer cervix, which is not the question that you're asking. In a per protocol analysis, sometimes a per protocol is actually powered also. A per protocol is where you have completed your treatment and only patients who completed the treatment are being analyzed. So this can lead to a lot of bias. And that's the reason intent to treat is always better than a per protocol analysis. So once you randomize, you always analyze. Yeah, Dr. Ritchie is saying that ITT once randomized is always analyzed. That's as short and sweet as it can be. Dr. Bhagya, <clears throat> is it fine? Yeah, yeah, thank you. All right. So guys, you all have clinical expertise, you know the patient values and rest was all covered by Dr. Senthil. Uh, thank you, thank you Dr. Senthil and uh, over to you Dr. Lata. Senthil, a wonderful opening. So I hope we will uh, have the same quality of lectures throughout this research methodology series. And uh, we welcome all the participants back next Saturday. Next Saturday we have three speakers Dr. Patro, Dr. Kakar, and Dr. Anand, and they will be speaking a little bit more in depth on odds ratios, relative risks, interpretation of forest plot. There was one question on systemic reviews and meta-analysis, so we will answer that question in the next talk and on survival curves. So hope to see you all back next uh, Saturday. Thank you very much again, Dr. Sendil, Dr. Sabyata. See you next Saturday then. Bye. Thank and you. Have a Thank good you, everyone. Day. Thanks all, and have a nice Thank weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah,